Welcome to Summit. We strive to be a church where you can belong long before you come to believe. At each of our locations, we worship together, learn and grow together, serve together, and form relationships around a common purpose to inspire people to find and follow the way of Jesus. Take a moment and scan the QR code. That leads to our guide for all things Summit. You'll discover info about events, uh, ways to engage in community here, resources mentioned in today's sermon, and ways to give. So now, as we jump into our service today, we invite you to lean in, offer your full attention to the Lord, and may the grace of Jesus be with you always. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, for your love and your strength and a peace that surpasses all understanding. For Lord, we know that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but it is your word that will last forever. In Jesus' holy and precious name we do pray, amen. Romans 8 is a dance. And you are listening to the sermons and partaking in the devotions that we have been giving out for Romans. It can become clear that Paul is dancing dancing between the tension of both the spiritual living and our own human propensity. A dance that is supposed to mentally and spiritually stretch you. Paul is prodding at the polarity of the human being. We are not compartmentalized machines. We are whole embodied beings, but we still stand in tension oftentimes in our lives. Paul in Romans is acknowledging that. He has an infatuation with the active participation and transformation of the spirit dwelling within us as human beings. Paul dances. Sometimes he dances elegantly and other times more clunky between the spirit dwelling in the human being and the human being living with in flesh. It would seem that Paul rightly so writes to the person who is clear that their life in Christ is in fact a tug of war between what is righteous and what is death dealing. That this must be true even if we take inventory of our own lives, that we as humans come to a wall of feeling the weight of a God-ordained anointing upon our lives and how it often opposes what we actually want to do who we actually want to be, what actually feels good to us in the moment. In other words, really, all of this can be condensed down to the phrase that being a follower of Jesus is difficult. It's hard. And Paul does acknowledge that particular work in a very particular way in Romans 8. One of my favorite American thinkers, theologians, and ethicists, Stanley Harawas, extensively discusses what Paul talks about in Romans 8 this type of spiritual journey, our faith and its difficulties in many of his own biblical writings. And he often argues that the explicit change that we see in ourselves that takes place in our own hearts via the Holy Spirit shows God's glory and should, should eventually transform the entire world. However, the issue with that, the explicit change sometimes feels like a fool's errand very difficult task, a frustrating and exhausting task. Why? Because it's a dance. This life is a dance, a dance that has great tension. We as followers of Jesus try our best to make many moral and ethical decisions based on the Holy Spirit. But sometimes, if we can just be honest with each other, the flesh is loud. Other things, even outside of the Spirit, are just loud sometimes. Sometimes, I don't want to listen to the Spirit. If I can be honest with you, sometimes I just don't want to listen. The Holy Spirit is asking sometimes too much of me. Sometimes the Holy Spirit wants me to be the bigger person, the audacity. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is pushing me to see something about myself I'm just not ready to face. We've all been there. Don't you hate that? Don't you hate how the Spirit of God tells me about me better than I can, especially when the Spirit knows that I refuse to go to these very hard and difficult places. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is calling me to a place that just makes 
me uncomfortable, my flesh uncomfortable. And I think we all know that the comfortability of our flesh is sometimes more appealing simply because it's just easier. But of course, we know that our faith demands that there has to be a perspective shift even in the tension of that dance. It has to have an explicit change. However, sometimes, as we've acknowledged, that's just harder said and done sometimes. I mean, even Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11, where he says, but you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, then the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Paul emphatically states, if Christ is in fact in you, the body should be dead to sin, but we are still alive in Christ. That is the language of a dance. That is the language of a complicated dance. Paul then, in consideration of those who are reading this letter, invites the Christians into not simply theory, but an actual robust ethic that comes with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That if you are dead to sin and alive in Christ, then that comes with a level of an ethic that one must live by. This is why in reading Romans or really any letter that Paul writes, it's frustrating. He is always trying to push us to a very particular ethic of the heart and how it shows up in our lives and in our actions and in our giving and who we are around people and community. This is why he says that when we are dead to sin, Sin, but alive in Christ, that that is a spiritual and ethical paradox. To be dead and alive at the same time. To be dead to the old, but alive in the new, the perceived new. It's a both and formation of the body. In other words, if our sinfulness, hear me, if our sinfulness is an actual reality that shows up through our actions, our proclivities, and our problematic behavior, for those of us who are also alive in Christ, then our righteousness must also include some concrete examples that the Holy Spirit is actually living on the inside of us. A lot of times the former shows a lot more concrete examples than the latter. In other words, when, when we look at ourselves, can we see the dance? Can we see the tension? Can you see, of course, that I am still struggling with anger, but also notice in me that I'm slower to get angry? Do you see that? Or, or can you see, of course, I still struggle with lust, but notice that I am constantly working on my own boundaries? Can you see that, of course, I still struggle with greed, but also notice that how I'm slowing down in my consumption? Can you see that, yes, I am still struggling with showing judgment to people, but notice I am also asking more questions and trying to be a little bit more curious. It's a dance. There's tension. It's a both and. This is not perfection. This is formation, a work in progress. If you are willing to have a shift in your perspective, then you are willing to dance as Paul invites us to. We are still in Romans 8 sermon series where we are walking through Paul's theology and what types of people we are in Christ. Michael helped us walk through the concept of us no longer being condemned. And in that, in being set free, we are no longer obligated to be beholden to our old nature of sin. This week, we are going to examine the perspective shift that Paul walks us through, walks the Roman people through, that if we are no longer condemned and we no longer have this obligation of sin, what does that actually look like and play itself out in our own lives? So listen to what Paul calls us to via our spiritual ethic. We are going to read Romans 8, and I want to read verses 18 through 28. And the word of the Lord reads like this. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is about to be revealed in all of us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope 
that the creation itself will be set free from its enslavement to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together as it suffers together the pains of labor and not only the creation, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the spirit and we groan inwardly while we wait for our adoption, the redemption of our bodies for in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is in fact not hope for who hopes for what all, what they already see. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very every spirit intercedes with the groanings too deep for words, and God, who searches hearts, knows what is the, in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And of course, verse 28, for we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Man, Paul knows how to just say a whole bunch of words. This section of Romans can be honestly a 12 week sermon series on its own. Paul says a mouthful, but since we don't have 12 weeks to consider these verses, how about we just gonna hold hands and lightly jog through what Paul is trying to get us to see. There are some perspectives, some gems that we can take away out of Romans 8. If we were to hold hands and kind of jog through these verses together, that there is a perspective shift that Paul is trying to get us to see. We can argue that all of Romans, really, all of Romans 8, even up to this point, Paul is really trying to turn us and shift our perspective on something that's a little bit bigger than us. And so I want to talk through Romans 8 through three very distinct perspectives. And the first perspective that I wanna to talk to is the perspective of suffering. It starts off in verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed to us. Paul, in using the verb consider, that Greek word lo logizomai, suggests that he has come to a certain level of conviction based on something. He reckons, he believes, he considers, he has reason and concludes a very strong statement that the present day sufferings in comparison to a newer glory in God, for some reason for Paul, is actually not a comparison at all. How does Paul get to this controversial conclusion? How does he get to a space where he can preach this even to other folks? I have to be honest with you, even in my own pastoral role, I am often confronted with the question that Paul talks through in the latter parts of Romans 8. I'm confronted with the question of suffering all the time. For many folks, their faith hinges on this question. There is so much nuance that goes into these conversations because when people talk about suffering, they bring their own life experience to the conversation. That is how one contextualizes suffering. This is common and it's ancient in practice. Suffering is fluid and is defined differently from person to person, culture to culture, and even era to era. I know that there are many of you even listening to the sound of my voice, living within the tension of spirit and flesh, particularly under the weight of suffering. You are trying your best to be a good apprentice to Jesus, but life has a very particular way of presenting itself. Life is heavy for so many of you right now. There's so many folks right now who are dealing with medical issues, financial issues, family issues, marital issues, friendship issues, housing issues, even spiritual issues. You even have beef with the Lord. And in the midst of those issues, we may find ourselves looking to the heavens and asking the ancient question, where in the world is God? This is especially true even for younger generations who I have the honor and privilege of really pastoring who find themselves disenchanted with the idea of the benevolent characterization of God. Yet in this text, Paul tells the people in Rome that he is convinced of a very particular thing. 
that he is convinced that there is something out there that should change our perspective of the tension of suffering. Paul tells us that suffering and all of the pains that it brings pales in comparison to what God has for you in eternal glory. The latter portions, and and Michael last week talked about what that idea of eternal glorification looks like, that Paul brings us to that perspective. Paul tells us the suffering and all of the pains that it brings pales in comparison. A glory that defeats pain, a glory that vanquishes suffering, a glory that heals, a glory that will inevitably win. This is the argument that Paul lays before the people. Paul has an eternal, a forever, an infinite perspective in this passage. And if honestly, if if I can be honest with you, and if you can even be honest with me, that perspective is sometimes very difficult to hold on to. People are suffering right now in real time. They need assistance, healing, refuge, and hope right now, not just in the future, but many of us, many people you may know, they need it right now. Now, an eternal perspective gives a great shouting moment. It, it's, it's, a, it's a great theology to hold on to, but sometimes that moment isn't sustained in our present moment. How can we believe and hold on to this eternal perspective that Paul presents? It would seem that Paul is able to feel this way is because he has an understanding of something. He understands that Universal notions of suffering bring about a level of solidarity and empathy in the believer. Suffering, suffering well, does something to you if you do it well. He believes in this empathy to the believer. Glory is an end road to a subject matter that has been exhaustively discussed, but inadequately answered. Suffering has been debated by some of the greatest minds in philosophy, theology, and science, and those answers sometimes feel incomplete. Any talk really of suffering devoid of the transformative and mobilizing notions of suffering is no real conversation at all. And Paul knows this. The encouragement to hold on to eternal glory is not absent from present day solutions. Let me say that again. The encouragement, even as a pastor, to encourage you to hold on to the eternal glory of God is not absent from present day solutions. The encouragement comes with an ethic to realize that we are all in kinship with each other. It is the famous Oscar Romero quote where he says that there are many things that can only be seen through the eyes of someone who has cried is a contextualizing moment, what suffering can do. Paul states, even in, um, if we get down to verses 19, all the way down to 22, where he says, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, for the creation was subjected to this level of suffering or futility, not of its own will, of course, but by the will of the one who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will be set free from its enslavement to decay and will obtain this freedom of glory of the children of God. That we know that even all, the whole, all of creation has been groaning together. You hear that? That's a solidarity term, that we are all in movement and in solidarity. And Paul and Paul is kind of unraveling that type of theology that the whole universe, all of this thing is groaning together as it suffers together the pains of labor. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the spirit. We groan inwardly while we wait for the adoption and the redemption of our bodies, all of creation. That is an empathetic statement. That is a statement of solidarity. All of creation, we groan in pain. All of creation awaits for the change to happen. All of creation is patiently waiting for God to move and redeem what has finally been broken. All of creation has been groaning together. The systems of brokenness are vast and reach past our own individualism, but brokenness affects us all in very unique ways. And in that way, we eagerly wait for the pain to subside side so that we can finally experience a level of liberation that was promised to us. This is what Paul preaches, that this is true in the groans of our body. 
that we all know that sometimes even the never, it, it never really turning into healing can even lead to death. But yet we still eagerly wait because we have hope in the eternal glory of God. We live in pain, but we also live in hope. That's the dance. That's what Paul is trying to get you to see. We live in pain, but we live in hope. We live in suffering, but we live in hope. It's a dance, ladies and gentlemen. And, and I, I must say, I'm a reader. I'm a studier. And I, I will read all the philosophers that have been grappling with this idea of hope and suffering. I will read all of the theologians that have been grappling with suffering and hope. I will be uh, reading all of the scientific and philosophical notions of what does it mean to grapple with suffering and hope. But ladies and gentlemen, I am at the stage in my life where there has to be some truth to what Paul is saying. And everything else has to be a lie. There has to be truth to what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying has to be true and everything else must be a lie. I look at this world and the level of heartbreak it brings and many times I groan inwardly and say to myself, this can't be it. There has to be another way. This can't be the life lived abundantly that the scripture said to me. This can't be how it ends. There has to be something else other than this. You know, I often, when I read Romans, Romans 8, particularly these particular scriptures, I often think about my maternal grandmother when I read this text. So often as I was getting older, visiting my grandmother consisted of visiting her in hospital rooms. So often as I got older, being with Miss Catherine Mombly meant seeing her tied to machines and waiting for her to get out of surgery. I have so many images in my head of my sweet, beautiful grandmother having close calls and doctors not knowing what the next move would be. This was so much of her reality. And yet when we had to pronounce over her body ashes to ashes, and dust to dust, we knew that the only thing that I could think about was that this life can't be all that that woman will experience. This just can't be the, the last 15 to 20 years of what she had to go through can't be how this actually Ends. I refuse to believe that her life was lived in vain. I refuse to believe that a hospital bed, surgery operating rooms, nasty hospital cafeteria food, and bad news would be the end of my grandmother. This could not be it for her. I have to, for my own sanity, stay connected so that in glory she is experiencing a rest that she did not get here on earth. I stay in peace and solidarity with my grandmother because I know that even though she suffered here on earth, she now only knows peace with the Lord. I have to have this perspective. I just, I have to hold on to this perspective because if I don't, what else is there truly to hold on to? There is nothing that gives real peace, joy, and delight, knowing that the stupidity, nonsense, injustice, and evil someday have to bow down to the glory of an eternal God. You take away my hope in eternal glory, and you take away everything. For so many of you in this room, for so many of you listening to the sound of my voice, you are at that point. It's all you have. There has to be something greater than this, for it is in this idea of suffering that even shifts, and I, I wanna get to this second point, the second perspective shift, the perspective of hope that Paul is trying to change, not only our perspective of suffering, but also of hope that we have to do the holy work of destroying, hear me, we have to do the holy work of destroying our nihilism and pessimism about this life. It's a simple statement, but Christians, we have to find some hope and glory. All of the work that we do in this life has to be built upon the foundation of hope. Where Paul talks about this in verses 24 and 26, he says, for in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what is already what is seen. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Do you see that imaginative language that Paul is using? That we hope for things that we have not seen. We imagine a world where this is different. We see a world where this goes differently. 
Verse 26, he says, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the very spirit intercedes with the groanings too deep for words. And God who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. What Paul is trying to say here is that hope requires that you are able to see your holy imagination at work. Hope is not passive, nor is it empty. Hope requires that you are able to see what hasn't been seen. Dr. Craig Keener in his Romans commentary discusses that even in the Greco-Roman world, there needed to be some holy imagination to these people. That in the Greco-Roman world, Stoic philosophers have had cosmic pessimism and it ran rampant in the community. There was this prevailing idea that decay and deathly fate reigned supreme in the hearts and minds of the people. And they always used to say, we should just accept the way that this is. There even used to be debates going on in Jewish Roman communities on whether or not it was even good for God to create humanity. This growing community of people fell into nihilistic despair and squandered their ability for them to see and imagine a different world from the one they currently occupied. However, these ideas are not just ancient ones. Contemporary thought also still breeds a level of pessimism and apathy that is corrosive to modern people's hearts and minds today. History has proven that when pessimism settles, individualism becomes your religion. And when individualism becomes your religion, you become the worst version of yourself. Nihilism is corrosive and it will turn you into the worst version of who you are. Can I, can I just say something? And this goes along with both suffering and hope and, uh, and our abilities to destroy this nihilism. I want to say something, and this is going to step on some of your toes. And I'm going to hold your hand when I say this, but I think it needs to be said, especially in the context of what Paul is trying to tell us here. Hear me when I say this. Some of us, some of us have self-cared ourselves into oblivion. I want to say that again. Some of us have self-cared ourselves into oblivion. Let me put it this way. Some of us have glorified self-care and have become irrelevant in a world needing an active Christian who knows how to hold on to hope. I want you to hear my heart when I say this, a societal shift has happened when we have co-opted something that was meant for our health and mental delight. Even the term self-care is a late 20th century, 21st century concept. It came out during a space where people were trying to hold on to hope. We saw civil rights luminaries take hold of this concept, not for the sake of self-indulgence, but for the sake of us being able to sustain ourselves for the long haul of fighting for hope. The history of that term comes from a group of people who did the hard work of actively imagining a different world and the new hope that comes with it. It's active rest for the sake of community healing. It's taking care of oneself so that we may take care of others. Systematic rest help people hold on to active hope. Paul preaches against this level of apathy, individualism and self-indulgence when he speaks of a hope we do not see, but yet we wait for. That is what Paul is preaching. We don't see it yet, but we actively wait for it. The word wait in its original language paints the picture of someone who isn't just sitting down and being lazy while waiting, but waiting with the perseverance in how they actually wake up every morning and live. Paul is broadcasting a type of waiting that shows the world, this is how you actually hope. The eternal glory that we, we look forward to, this should create this brand new imagination of how you see the world. And we wait, not in laziness, but we wait uh, uh, with a systematic level of hope and activeness. Hope is not a byproduct of lethargic forms of engaging the world, but hope is people actively reflecting the glory of Christ via how you move in the world. 
We hope, therefore we do. We hope, therefore we act. We hope, therefore we fight. We hope, therefore we heal. We hope, therefore we eagerly wait. That type of hope isn't easy and it's not popular. It requires us to be stubborn and not even pay attention to our own limitations sometimes. This is why Paul tells Greco-Roman Christians that even as you continue to fight the good fight of hoping for a new world, there will be times, this is hard work, there will be times where you reach the end of you. And you realize that even in my own weakness, I need help. But we serve a savior who speaks fluently in eternal groans and moans and can interpret what you need before you even know what you need. Then the spirit goes before you. And in the nick of time, God can do what only God can do. Paul tells us that we can't really see what we are hoping for, but God can. When we feel like we can't go any further, God can. When we feel like hope is foolish, God can. When the world is breaking my heart, God can. When I don't know what to do anymore, God can. Even when we can't fully see what we are hoping for, God intercedes in the midst and reckons with your imagination of what the world can actually be, where God shows up and does what only God can do. And so that perspective of suffering, this perspective of hope brings us to this perspective of life, a life well lived. In Paul's thesis of suffering and hope, he gives us clarity about a life well lived. A life well lived is a life that embraces the dance of suffering and hope. A life well lived understands the tension of flesh and spirit. In verse 28, Paul states this text that so many of us know, but it's a very difficult text where Paul says, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. With the intent, hear my heart, with the intent to detangle the messiness of this verse tenderly. We must detangle ourselves from the notion, hear me, I want you to hear me well. When we read verses like this, Paul's theology, we must detangle ourselves from the notions of an outcomes-based theology that places the character of God at the hands of what happens to us. Hear me, we have to destroy, detangle, move away from, an outcomes-based theology that characterizes who God is based on what happens to us. This is an unhealthy way to handle this verse when so many people have the right to read it and ask, what do you actually define as good, Paul? I love God very much, and yet there is so much good that is not working together for me in this moment. So Paul, when you use the word good, what do you actually mean? So why should I read what Paul says here and find hope in it? It's a difficult and complex thing. I, as I was preparing myself for this sermon, I was stuck because Roman Paul is all over the place. And Paul says some very difficult things, right? Especially for the modern ear. And even for me, I, I don't want to just, because I'm preaching to you, it, it's a struggle for me too. We have modern 2024 ears. And so these words sometimes fall on hard ground. And so as I was struggling with this sermon, I I decided to probe the mind of one of my favorite people, Dr. Jim Miller, who is a New Testament professor at Asbury Seminary. And he is also a partner here at Summit who goes to our Lake Mary campus. And we were talking on the phone through the language of Romans. And if and if I am honest, I admit it to him that I was struggling with how to take Pauline language and contextualize it for our own modern ears, that suffering is such a tough and nuanced thing to talk about, Dr. Miller. And if you know me, if you know my heart for the people who really know me, you know that my ears are always focused on those whose backs are against the wall, if I can steal the language of Dr. Thurman. I'm always focused and my heart is always postured towards those who are experiencing the unbearable weight of life. He then said something that was so simple yet profound, unlocking so much of this text for me. He stated, as I was talking, he said, you know, he's just such a great listener. And then he'll just say something simple. And it unlocked this thing for me where he says, suffering is a universal thing, Johnny, and no one will ever escape it but our preaching should help people know that while they experience suffering, they are not defined by the experience of suffering. 
that understanding is what makes things working together for our good a remarkable statement that Paul begged God. This is Paul. And for those of us that know the history of Paul, this is the same man that begged God to deliver him from this painful experience, this thorn in his side that he talked about in scripture, yet God never answered his prayer. What was working together for Paul's good then? Paul asked God to deliver him and God said no. So what was actually working together for Paul's good in that moment? The good that Paul wanted was something I assumed would have been beneficial to his health, his pockets, his family, his ministry. And yet when God did not grant him his request, he concluded this, this very controversial statement that the grace of Christ was still in fact sufficient. Paul didn't define himself by the suffering. It plagued him. It was a part of him, it formed him, it shaped him, but he refused to be defined by it. Now, this doesn't mean that we ignore the interior frustrations that come with suffering. We are human beings having real human experiences that needs to be engaged well. We are all called to be our brother and sister's keepers and stand in the gap for when people need our help. However, you can never run around this. You have to run through it. It does, however, mean that we have to face the dance of life head on and realize that even in suffering, the goodness of the Lord is not defined by him completing our checklist. The goodness of the Lord is defined simply by him being God. He's God. A God that still loves, a God that still blesses, a God that still hears us and walks with us. What is working together for our good is not the circumstances, but it's God. We are still loved and seen by God. And for many of us, that is the only truth that is keeping us from falling into complete despair. When life ain't good, God is. Bad grammar, but good theology. When life ain't good, God is. In fact, God is so good that it is the peace that surpasses all types of human understanding. That is the hope of glory. That is the reality that makes suffering compel in comparison. And why Paul says that all things are still working together for the good of those who love him. I end with this. There's this old passed down story that has been told for generations. And it was retold in a book that I currently am reading or just finished actually entitled Dancing in the Darkness, Spiritual Lessons for Thriving in Turbulent Times by an incredible scholar and pastor, Dr. Otis Moss III. And in one of the forewords of this book, the author tells this story as the basis of the book and our necessity to always tightly hold on to hope even during the worst times of our lives. The story goes like this. It says that there was a young lady once who was complaining to her mother about all of the suffering and troubles and was wondering aloud to her mother how she would make it through these hard times. The story goes on to say that her mother said nothing to her. Her mother grabbed her by the hand and led her daughter into the kitchen and she filled three pots with water. And in those three pots, in one of them, she placed carrots and the next one she placed eggs and in the other one, she placed coffee beans. And she turned the knobs up and all of those pots began to boil with the water and the contents that were in them. And after bringing each pot to a boil, she removed the contents and she placed them all in a bowl and she started to teach her daughter. She explained to her daughter that even though they had all been subject to the same condition, each item reacted differently. She said that the carrots went into the boiling water strong and unbending. Yet they came out of the water weak and soft. She said that the eggs had been fragile, their liquid interior protected by a thin shell. And yet after they came out of the boiling water, their insides were hardened by the heat. She then made her daughter pay attention to the coffee beans. She said the coffee beans were barely altered by the boiling water, but they actually turned their surroundings into something else. The thing that was simply boiling water has now produced a new liquid and a sweeter aroma. She then looked at her daughter and said, baby, which one are you going to be during this time? 
Will you be hardened or softened by the troubles? Or are you willing to take something that has been harsh? Are you willing to take something that has rejected you? Are you willing to take something that has been hard on you? Are you willing to take suffering? Are you willing to take the harsh realities of this world and turn it into something beneficial that creates something different and a sweet aroma to the Lord? So summit. And everybody listening to my voice, I leave you with the same question. Suffering is inevitable. It can be unbearable and it can be forming and unjust. However, as Christians, will you take the boiling water of suffering, add some coffee beans called hope and make a sweet aroma to God? This is how Paul can boldly say that this current situation pales in comparison to the glory of God that awaits us because he shows us the way of how to actively wait on the hope of Jesus Christ now. This is the perspective shift that we need. Let's pray. Father God, you are good and kind. Be patient with us. Show us how to suffer well. Show us to have a new holy imagination to hope better. And let us live a life that is well-pleasing unto you. In Jesus' holy and precious name we do pray. Amen.
What is working together for our good sometimes is not our circumstances, but it is just actually God. A God that sees you, a God that knows you, and a God that still loves you. So please hear these words of benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the precious Holy Spirit. Go in God's peace. We'll see you next time.